Well, this morning, in keeping with the vine theme, apparently, we had that in uh, Psalm 80, and we've had communion. If you'll turn to John 15, John chapter 15. We're going to look at the Father's love. In Father's Day, very often, um, or as in Mother's Day and some of the other holidays, we'll have a special occasion where we make much about fathers, make much about mothers, and there's nothing particular, particularly wrong with that, but I always want to be careful about coming to church to worship and spending too much time on ourselves and making worship about ourselves, right? So I thought it most appropriate once again to make this about our Heavenly Father. And I, this passage to me is poignant because it's about Christ's relationship with his Father. So we're going to look at the presence, the pruning, the permanence, and the proof. So it's the the presence of the vine and the vine dresser, uh, the pruning for productivity, permanence in Christ, and proof of abiding. So in verse 1, Jesus begins with, I am the true vine. Now that's a, a statement that might stop us there for a second. We might stop and say, I am the true vine as opposed to what, a false vine? What is he doing here? We've got to remember the audience Jesus is speaking with are the disciples, and they're very Jewish at this time still. Most of uh, the forming of the first century church begins very heavily Jewish and becomes more and more Gentile as time goes on. So as we saw in, in Psalm 80, they tend to think of themselves as as the, the vine that was planted, rooted in Israel, in Jerusalem. So Jesus is preparing them here, this kind of a paradigm shift coming, right? And he keeps telling them this is a, in more ways than one, there's a paradigm shift. One of the paradigm shifts is that he keeps telling them, I'm, I'm going to be leaving you, I'm going to be departing soon. He's preparing them for this. But also what he's preparing them for that they don't really quite understand yet is that things are shifting now as far as the dynamic of God's plan for the ages. It's going to be shifting away from Israel, Israel as the uh, elect body that the Lord uses that line to bring about the Messiah. <clears throat> and the Messiah is here. And that pinpoints the shift where things start changing. So he's telling them, I am the true vine. So he's preparing them for this and how things are changing. But he also says that my father is the vine dresser. Now, a vine dresser, that's just, you know, it's the farmer. The farmer at the vineyard. He's a person who prunes and cultivates the vines. Um, notice there's a, a couple of different processes going on here. He prunes and cultivates. The pruning will happen with the believer in addition to the, in addition to the cultivating. The pruning um, is not such a fun process. You know, as you're working on plants and you probably do this around the house or in the garden, you find those leaves that are kind of browning and curling up or whatever, and, and that, that plant or that little branch or vine or whatever on that plant's not looking so healthy, so you got to kind of break that off, snip it off, whatever it takes. And the Lord does this with us. And uh, I would say that w one of the ways that I know the most that uh, I am a true believer is uh, I experience regularly that pruning in my life. Um, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. 
And, uh, you know, I've had a few paddles in my life, and I get some pruning here and there, a little nip, a little tuck. And that's what the Lord does in cultivating. The, the rest of the plant does better when you cut off some of that excess. Or you've got, um, uh, on a fruit plant, you've got this little bundle of whatever growing, and it's... Um, looking a little brown gray it's not really doing much but it's just kind of sapping water away from the rest of the plant that's growing well so you you cut that away so this is what the vine dresser does and this is this is the father's activity in our lives so jesus is saying i'm the vine and uh, my father is the vine dresser <clears throat> that's part of that activity that he's doing but the context is when we get here is that it's really poignant that um, I'm permitted to speak this particular message today because this is Jesus' departure sermon for his disciples. He's getting ready to make an exit. We know the nature of that exit, but it's really quite poignant. But let's, um, if you flip back a couple chapters to chapter 13, I just wanted to hop, skip, and jump through a couple of verses here of what's going on with the context because Jesus has been in the upper room. You remember he had the foot washing ceremony and he's washing the disciples' feet. Um, let's, let's look at chapter 13. Let's look at verse 1 to start off with. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. But then what we've got going on to in, in uh, verse 2 is uh, Judas Iscariot and the devil is ready to betray him. So Judas becomes literally possessed by Satan at that point. Look at verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, wrapped it around his waist, and then he does the foot washing. Let's look down, for example, um, verse 10, Jesus said to them, the one who has uh, bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean but not every one of you. Again, in verse 11, he, he, it, it reiterates how he stressed, not every one of you are clean. But what he's talking about there, he's alluding to Judas. But I want to point this out because in the story of the vine, Jesus kind of continues along that theme that this is the thing that happens. Um, flip a page, if you must, chapter 13. Um, verse 21, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain whom he spoke. I think that's remarkable. I think it's remarkable. I, I don't recall ever hearing a sermon that really highlighted this, but um, the deception is such that this Judas is among them and they didn't even know, they didn't recognize who he was. He looked like them. He's one of us. Can this happen here in this church, in every church? Well, we can guarantee it can and it does. So this is the caution. They didn't even know who it was. And they were going, is it, is it me? It's not me, is it? Is it you? So some of them were, were questioning their own hearts. As with communion here, examining their hearts. They were examining their hearts at the time, saying, wow, it did, could, it, could it be me? Am I going to be the? I'm not going to be the one doing this, am I? And then he, he's going to continue this theme that he starts off in um, verse 35 of chapter 13. He'll continue this theme at the end of chapter 15. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Then in chapter 14, um, there's much to read there, and I urge you to read that on your own. We're not going to go into that. I'm going to spare you that, and you can say thank you to me later. 
There's a lot in there. It's very rich. And I love that chapter, but we're, we just don't have the time to go into that. But look at the, the pruning. So verse 1 is the presence of the vine and the vine dresser. 15.2, chapter 15.2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, I want you to notice that part. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, disabuse yourself of Pauline theology here. Pauline meaning of theology of Paul. Paul has not come on the scene yet. Paul is the one that talks about being in Christ, right? And usually in that context, being in Christ means like being in the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We're the body. We, we get that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in particular, right? Jesus is not talking about in me in that way. Those terms have not really um, been taught yet. Um, actually, there is no church yet per se. There's no Acts chapter 2. So we're not there yet. But so then, okay, so what is he talking about? So he takes them away. What it alludes to is verse 6, and we'll get there. But it's taken away in judgment. Think of, of Matthew, Matthew 7. We can take a, a quick look. Matthew 7, if you want to turn there real quick. We probably should. Matthew 7, let's look at verses, um, beginning of verse 15. We'll just read 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. Mark that. Is there fruit in your life? This is the part of examining yourselves again. It's something we must all do. Every healthy tree brings forth good fruit, bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear fruit bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's judgment. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. This is a mandate from Christ. This is a command, right? And we get that sometimes. Don't judge me. You're not supposed to judge. Well, we don't judge somebody's salvation, but we are to be fruit inspectors. You've probably heard that term before, and this is where we get that, Matthew chapter 7. You've got to look at the fruit. You got to look, how are you going to look at the fruit from among yourselves in the church and know whether somebody is a wolf that's dressed like a sheep unless you're examining what is coming forward? So that's what he's talking about here. He's, he's, he's talking about um, how the father takes away uh, just as the vine dresser does he takes away the bad fruit he takes away the bad branches the evil tree the evil fruit so Jesus in, in verse 2 he says and every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit in other words you're going to bear more fruit as a church as a body of believers the vine is going to bear more fruit if you get away the broken or dying branches or the diseased branches, as he just said in Matthew chapter 7. This is critical. So he prunes that away. He cuts away the dead wood. And that's what he's going to do is he's going to cut away dead wood. So he cultivates the church. He cultivates believers by cutting away the dead twigs and the leaves that hinder growth. You know, I... I um, I saw a thing with um, about, I, I was curious, on my property there are all these trees that Hillary hates. Lots and lots of trees and lots of vines coming up them and a lot of them are uh, poison ivy. And I'm, you know, it looks pretty growing up the tree but I'm looking at them and then I, I wanted to find out some good ways of cleaning that out without 
getting it all over myself or her getting it all over herself and then it's just a nasty mess to deal with. So it's, and I didn't want to get the, the poison and get it into the ground and harm the animals, harm the ground, all that kind of stuff. So I was looking at some solutions to that. And, and part of that, it was just talking about those vines that grow on and attach themselves to the tree. And there's, uh, the, I got the, I didn't know what the name of it was, but they're little, little runners, little creepers. Hostoria. You ever hear that word? That's what they are. Uh, they're called H-A-U-S-T-O-R-I-A. -A, Hostoria. They're the little runners, the little suckers that come out of th these um, vines and will attach themselves to other vines or to the trees. And they leech off them. They're parasites. They suck the nutrients and the water off of the tree. And it'll weaken the tree. And the tree, as you know, they grow from the center out. And the part that's alive is on the outside. And they're sucking off the water that's helping the tree grow. And it can you know, end up with downed trees. And um, same kind of thing with a vine, with the, with the grapes. These little suckers get in there and they start taking the nutrients from the vine. So the vine dresser starts pruning some of that back and starts cutting that back so that there can be growth. Oh, and by the way, one of the things I learned that you can do with these uh, hostoria is you can get some little wire snips or whatever and you go to the bottom of those poison ivy vines and you can just snip them. You cut off their water supply from the ground and it's not usually enough coming from the tree to sustain them and they'll die. They'll die off. That's a bonus tip. That one's for free. I wish it were that simple in the church though, but sometimes people need to be cut off and you got to determine that from, the, from their fruit. And that's what your elders do is uh, keep an eye out for these. Um, Wolves who come in among the fold, and it happens everywhere. But you, you hope to cultivate the church. You hope to see repentance. You hope to see changed hearts. And it, it is all about the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Not just the things you see on the outside, but the motivation of what's going on here, right? And then Jesus says in verse 3, he says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So you are clean. They, they are clean. He was talking to the disciples. He says, already you're clean. But why are they clean? Because of the word I've spoken to you. Notice it's something that the Lord does, Jesus does, and it's part of the sanctification process. And I wish I had time to go in further into that, but there's so much um, richness in what he's telling them here. But the believers, the true branchers, continually undergo this pruning and cultivation and the purification of the word must be in place. It's the word that purifies. The word that cultivates, the word that cultivates us, cultivates our hearts. So the fruit, the fruit isn't something we bear, not, it's something we bear not to join the vine we don't bear fruit so that we can join the vine. But because we're already in the vine and are now his, we are his workmanship created for, his, um, for good works. Ephesians 2, right? Ephesians 2.10. We're created in Christ for good works. So that's where the fruit comes from. We don't come in with our fruit and try to join the vine. So everyone will bear fruit. Sometimes it might be kind of a little bit of a withering grape, I don't know. Um, but we always hope for, we always hope for more fruit, more growth, greater cultivation. Galatians 5, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law and condemnation under the law. There will be fruit or you're not truly of the vine. So we're looking at attitude issues here. But there's two kinds of fruit. 
MacArthur likes to say there's attitude fruit and there's action fruit. So the right fruit, the heart fruit, are these motivations, the peace, patience, kindness. And they come out of a, a pure heart in the sense of it's your morality, the moral law, the things you do. Now you flip that, flip that and do the action first, and it can easily become legalism, right? So if you're out trying to do these things to show that, to demonstrate to yourself that you have the right heart and that you're part of the true church, the true body of Christ, the vine, then you have to examine your fruit and your fruit is not going to be your actions. The fruit has got to be examine your heart. So there's attitude fruit and there's action fruit and you don't want to mess up the order because you've got to have your attitude right. Got, your heart's got to be right before you can produce the actions. Otherwise, it's just wood, hay, and stubble. But now, look down at verse 4. He says, abide in me and I in you. Abide. Uh, that, that means not just live in me, but attach yourself to me. Um, these little runners and fake branches and things, they will attach. And they will come and they will attach here. And they will attach to you. I, I don't know what folks get out of it. You know, sometimes if they're not true believers, sometimes they want what you've got. Um, sometimes they want to be something. And um, sometimes, uh, I don't know, maybe they want to network. Sometimes they're lying to themselves. And they've come up under a false system and they think this is just the behavior, the way I grew up doing it, so this is what I do. But true abiding in Christ is where the nutrients from Christ flow up through the vine and into you and outward and you produce fruit. So again, the first place fruit inspection really must start is within yourself. It always must start within yourself and not looking at other people and saying, is this person bearing fruit? The first place we need to examine is within ourselves always. So the branch we know the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. And you take the branch off. I mean, some of the fruit that started on there might continue for a little while, but that's going to be about it. But we've got to be in Christ. We've got to abide in Christ. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself in verse 4, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Again, we're not talking about merely being numbered with Christ. Remember, it's, it's, Judas was numbered with the 12. He was numbered with the 12. Scripture does not say he was one of them as far as um, being a true believer. He was numbered with them, but he wasn't truly one of them as we find out. So it means stay. We abide, we, we stay, or we remain, we remain in Christ. It's easy for me to say. We remain in Christ. So the I in you part that Jesus says, abide in me and I in you, means that if you're truly in Christ, if you're truly in the vine, it's a fait accompli, which is a term that means it's an accomplished fact. It's a done deal. You're not going anywhere. It refers to something that's already happened or been done and cannot be changed. This term often is used to describe the actions that are completed before those affected by it. Um, are in position to query or reverse it. In other words, it's a done deal. That's what the term means. And that's the same thing with us in Christ. We're not going to be taken away because, oh, we were bearing fruit and we stopped. We go through seasons, right? But the true test is if that continues. One way or another, does it continue that we're not producing anything? Or does it continue that we're producing good fruit? I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't generate fruit by yourself because uh, 
a branch separated from the vine cannot bear fruit or even sustain its own life, right? But verse 6, and this is chilling, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Again, MacArthur refers to these as Judas branches because this refers to those who come in. They, they might have an agenda and they live among you, but they don't produce good fruit. They produce evil fruit. This is eternal judgment. Notice in verse 5 that the branches don't abide and they sustain, uh, and sustain themselves. Um, Jesus said, and I in him, contrast that here, here in verse 6 where he says, uh, we see where he says, uh, does not abide in me. So Judas was not abiding in him. But there's no question or mention of a question of uh, does not abide in me or I in him. For these withering branches, there was no life from the vine ever entering in. Judas had to suck nutrients away. He didn't naturally produce it. And it wasn't enough for good fruit, was it? Because they have just these little runners, just enough to sustain whatever it is they're doing, whatever their motivations are. If you abide in me, verse 7, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. you know, Psalm 37, 4 says, uh, delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that doesn't mean like a genie, where... Whatever you want, you know, you rub the lamp and make a wish and uh, that's, he'll give you the desires of your heart. What it means is he will put the desires in your heart that you should have. He'll give you the desires of your heart. The Lord will give you those desires. This is the same type of meaning here. If you abide in me and my words abide in, me, in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Why? Because your heart and your motivations are going to be correct. By this, and here we get to the proof of the abiding. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove or demonstrate to be my disciples. Are you a disciple of Christ? Are you bearing fruit? Hopefully you're bearing much fruit. Demonstrate this evidence as Christ's disciple by the fruits of the Spirit. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Abide in my love. Well, so how do we abide in Christ's love? It's, is, it, is that that gushy, sentimental feeling? Oh, you know, we all love each other in Christ. We are one in the Spirit, you know. Or it's the outgrowth of our attitude or the actions. That's where love demonstrates itself. Verse 10 tells us, if you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love. So Christ's commandments are the very image of God, his, his nature. So he says, just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Note that he's not talking about a works-based salvation here. He's talking about you who are already in the vine, you're already believers. So he's talking to his fruit-bearing branches and describing his commandments, the desires he himself puts in the true believer to want to please Christ, to please the Father. We're nourished upon the words of Christ in the Bible, resulting in the fruit of our desires to please him by doing those things that we read about in his word. Those are the things he desires. So we want to please God. We want to keep his commandments. And the fruit begins there because it's a heart change. What do we do with sin? What do we do with God's commands? What is our attitude toward it? How are we going to live? What kind of fruit are we going to bring forth? And then verse 11, These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You want joy? Joy doesn't mean you're happy all the time, does it? Joy is where you're at in Christ and how that comes forth and how it lives forth in your life. The life of joy, though sometimes there's trials and tribulations, pain, lots of pruning, tribulations, persecution, 
you can still have joy because you're in Christ. You've read the end of the book, right? And you know how that ends, and we're in it. We're all in it in one way or another. Hopefully it's in a good way, right? And once you're born, you have eternal life. But where's it going to be? So be fruit examiners first in yourselves and then watch the fruit of others as you live church life, the body of Christ, and you protect one another. So the remainder of the chapter you should read, but it goes on in this vein. And I'll close out just with this next few verses that Jesus verses 12 through 17 that he says in his departing sermon that continues by the way his departing sermon continues but in verse 12 through 17 he says this is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you greater love is no one than this that someone laid down his life for his friends you are my friends if you do what I command you no longer do I call you servants for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing so he's disclosing so that's how we know that we're no longer just servants but I've called you friends for all that I, I have heard from my father I've made known to you verse 16 you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide wow so none of us get up and decide on our own to go join the vine no, it's not what it says here. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the Father's, ask the Father in my name, which means ask the Father in the way that I would ask and with the same motivation, ask in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you'll love one another. So this is... As I say, very poignant and moving message from Christ that he has for his disciples. Coming into the end of his first visitation on earth. And the things that concern him most are those among them that might be false leeching off them. And the others that love one another. Follow my commands, just do what I ask. Behave the way you're supposed to be and love one another. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that you give us that purifies us, that changes us. Lord, I can think of uh, no better person to, who knows how to say goodbye and, and offers caution to the saints than Jesus Christ. And I myself can offer little to what your words are, what your words already say. But just as a reminder, as a caution, that these are the things we need to do. This is what church life looks like. This is how we are to be to one another and for one another. And we are to be following you by listening to your commands, those things you want us to do. We need to be out in the world and sharing the gospel. Vines send runners out. Vines send the shoots out. Vines expand. And they grow. So Lord, we pray that that would be the case here for the Master's Church and for us as individuals going out into the world, Lord, that we bear fruit for Christ in your name. Amen. If you please stand. We have one more song. As a final scripture, uh, I'm going to read for you Matthew 7, verses 7 through 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, or everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be reopened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone 
Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask? And everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want to, them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Let's sing, This is my Father's world. <laughs> 